Yeah, so uh, this is this is the the book that uh, we have been uh, talking about, and it's about the economics of land degradation. And this session is very short. It's about the key research and policy uh, developments. And uh, the the thing which I'm going to be talking about uh, is that in 2015, COP12 of the UNCCD defined land degradation neutrality, and in the same year. Uh, the SDG uh, targets were set, uh, in which uh, the one which is relevant for, to our talk today is about life on land, which is 15.3, which defines uh, the, the land, uh, the, 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 but that it set a target that by 2030, uh, combat, combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land, affected by desertification, drought, and flood, and strive to achieve the land degradation neutral world. Now, what has happened since? Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the kind of research uh, questions, uh, what have been, uh, the research has been doing, uh, you can see this uh, interesting graph that uh, the, 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 the COP12 and the SDG 15.3 we are set in 2015. Just look at what happened. There were only 404 uh, publications then, but there was an exponential uh, uh, growth of the, the, the papers and the research on the e economics of land degradation, which means that the COP12 and the SDG 15.3, it really uh, gave an impetus to research on e economics of land degradation including our own research that uh, we, are, we are talking about today. From 404 uh, to 1,390 uh, by 2016, 20. And then it is still increasing. We still have one year to, uh, to, to uh, get uh, to the end of the, the, the time beans here, five year the time beans here. But already we have 1430 uh, publications. We don't know what's gonna happen until 2015, 2025 which I believe it's gonna be a lot more publications. Now, I just want to, to speak very briefly of what uh, the study that we did and that we're talking about today, uh, what we found and didn't find. Uh, the first one is we, 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 we have results on severity and extent of land degradation and the cost of land degradation and the gaps uh, and the future research that uh, um, I think that should, we, we should uh, talk about. Now, on the extent of land degradation, this is a very interesting uh, a map which is showing that uh, land degradation, which is shown in red, is happening all over. There was another study before this one, uh, which was led by Bai. It was showing land degradation only in developing countries. Like, but now look at what has happened uh, in this study that uh, we corrected for carbon fertilization and rainfall vari variation, and also even in cases where the, 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 the landowners would cover the degraded land, but for example, by putting more fertilizer to cover the degraded soils, we were also able to be able to find out there is land degradation all over the world, in developed countries and in developing countries. And this is uh, something which is, is very, very interesting. Now, in terms of the, the, the cost of land degradation itself, we found that each year, the world loses about 300 billion US dollars uh, due to land degradation. And this is something which is divided across all the regions of the world. Of course, the Sub-Saharan Africa is the one which is leading in terms of loss, uh, followed by the Latin, Latin American, Caribbean countries, and uh, North America uh, the region uh, comes third. And the Central Asia region is the one which has the lowest uh, uh, level of uh, cost of land degradation. Uh, of course, I'm showing the same, uh, the same uh, information here on the map. And you can see the, the kind of distribution that you can see that we saw on, the, on that graph. Now, who is bearing the cost of this land degradation that we are talking about? Surprising is that uh, the world is the one which is losing, it's bearing the heaviest burden of uh, the cost of land degradation. Yes, we know that, for example, if a farmer um, has a degraded land, their productivity, which is the provisioning services, it goes down. But 
the other the benefits are the the, 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 the the benefits for example carbon sequestration uh, by loss of biodiversity a lot of things they are born uh, a lot by 54 percent by the world uh, as a collective uh, 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 beneficiary of the the the, 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 ben the the ecosystem services. Now, what is the future research on economics of land degradation? Yes, our study was very good, but we did not cover everything. There is a lot of things that need to be done. The first one was, uh, for example, I was looking at okay, what 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 are the, the what's the scorecard of achievement of the uh, SDG fifteen point three? I couldn't find any study which is showing. The 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 the, the, uh, the target how 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 close are we to the to achieving the target? But there were some studies which were done in regions in countries, but not at the global level. So I think there is no there is need of periodic publication on assessment of progress of achievement of the UN SDG 15 on land degradation neutrality. And the other one was that our study we did not cover the, the, the uh, assessment of impact of land degradation and improvement on food security, migration, and climate change. Those are the things that uh, I think we need uh, to, to be talking about. So uh, I'm gonna stop here and uh, invite the, the panelists uh, to weigh in on this topic. And the first one to come in is uh, Ratan Lal, uh, who was also attended our, the launch of our book and he gave us really good comments. So Ratan, it's your time now to come uh, and uh, uh, talk about uh, the, the, this uh, this the topic. Oh, thank you very much uh, for sharing this excellent uh, presentation. The work on land degradation that you and Dr. Uh, and Brown did uh, is outstanding. It's very um, iconic, uh, very important reference sure. My only... Um, concern is um, land degradation. And I think we have discussed that. Um, some people think everything between the bedrock and the stratosphere is the land, and the soil is a part of it. But probably the major impact of economic impact of land is soil degradation. So perhaps uh, I'd like to hear some views from economic perspective uh, if we were to separate soil degradation out of the overall picture of land degradation, would the value of impact be different? Uh, I think that's a theoretical question, but uh, there is a big distinction between the two. Because land does include everything uh, which is on land, including, uh, of course, the anthropogenic uh, uh, population and uh, everything that comes with it. So, is there any? difference in economic impact if we were to sort out the soil degradation component from the overall land degradation? Wow, interesting question. And I invite uh, any input from anybody. That, that's an interesting question, which uh, Ratan Lal is a, is a soil scientist and uh, he wants us to tell us the, the difference between the land and the soil and, and such kind of things. So I invite any any feedback from anybody? Yeah. Well, I can I can just say that we are just starting this research. So in my group, we are starting to focus on all the different aspects of land degradation. And we have one person focusing on cropland and one person focusing on grasslands and, uh, and so on. And for all of these different land cover types, we try to distinguish between um, soil or things that are happening above the soil. And for example, for cropland, we try to account for uh, the compensation that happens by the farmers. So when the farmers are realizing their soil deteriorates, that then they might just increase inputs, like they use more fertilizer or more of other inputs. So you don't see any outcome difference, even though the soil is deteriorating. And we do try to correct for that statistically, but we're just starting. So I would not expect results in the, in the next month, but maybe by the end of the year. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. Any, any other input uh, from uh, Latanza's uh, question? 
Well, if I may, uh, yeah, the frame. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Ratan, you give us a challenge here. <clears throat> I believe um, that um, the frontiers on uh, soil degradation compared to the broader term of land degradation relates uh, to the um, soil biodiversity and life in soil. If we don't capture life in soil, um, yeah. for instance, the degradation of, um, of species richness in the soil, we, we don't capture uh, what, uh, what's happening uh, with um, um, long-term soil fertility and the opportunities to, to use life in soils for biopharmaceuticals and all of that. So there is really a much greater distinction necessary to define um, yeah. uh, soil, soil quality, um, soil biodiversity uh, as a part of the large uh, general term of land degradation. So uh, that would be my take of it. The economics which you asked is, um, of course, going far beyond what I've just said. The yeah. existence value of um, uh, of soil life, the potential value of soil based, soil micro based pharmaceuticals, we have no idea in the economics uh, profession. That is science for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Pavo, please, Wayne. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that there are several uh, questions that soil scientists can discuss uh, forever. Uh, what is soil, how deep is soil, and what is the difference be between land and soil? Well, uh, I should say that we can, we worked in a big project on uh, the economics of land degradation, and we discussed a lot these issues. And we believe that uh, in general, land consists of many components, and these components uh, live in different time scales. In some yeah. cases, we face the degradation of vegetative cover. And it doesn't reflect in any soil properties. It's just the change in the uh, moisture and temperature regime of soil. And when we speak about soil degradation, generally we believe that there are some changes in the conservative properties of soil, like the loss of organic carbon, or for example, the change of soil acidity alkalinity, or accumulation of soluble salts and so on. In some cases, we do not observe it, but still we have some land degradation reflected in the degradation of vegetative cover. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, maybe we can move to the next uh, speaker, uh, uh, who is uh, the Mural. Who... Oh, I wouldn't like to, <laughs> to try the last name, but Mural. Uh, Murali, uh, he's uh, from the G20 Land Restoration Initiative. Murali, please welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair. <clears throat> I was reminded of my first trip to the United States when <laughs> at the immigration counter, the uh -huh. officer asked me, can you can you sort of pronounce your name? And I, of course, very easily did it. And he said, oh, then it must be you. And <laughs> let me pass through. So don't worry about it. Uh, my name is not that common. Um, thank you. I um, I must say that I was very happy to uh, start to listen to this. And there was a reference to Dr. Klaus Toffer, who was my former boss in UNEP when I was uh, working in UNEP. And I'm very happy to learn that he is well. And I am also even more impressed to learn that he was associated with this uh, publication, which I have now taken a copy about. There is a reference to whether there is any update on the LDN commitments. And indeed, the committee for the review, review for the implementation of the UN and CCD uh, held its meeting in Samarkand in November, and an update was presented. And I have now uh, pasted that onto the um, onto the chat. I think it's probably not available to the participants. So if someone, the admin could 
take a copy of that and put uh, make it available to the participant that'll be good so there is indeed an update on this and the update is not good by the way um, while we have indeed committed to achieving land degradation neutrality by 2030 the latest data which actually is the data 2015 to 2019 shows that on an average we were further de degrading 100 million hectares per year so the challenge to achieve land degradation neutrality is you know even higher we used to talk about achieving 1 billion hectares by 2030 and now it's more looking more like 1.5 billion hectares if if at all we were to reach that target so the news is really not good now i must say that i i come into this economics uh, seminar uh, from a slightly different uh, angle i took up this job of the director of the g20 global land initiative which is an initiative started by the G20 countries in the, under the Saudi Arabian presidency of the G20 in 2020, where the G20 countries committed to achieving 50% reduction in land degradation by 2040, which we then estimated that we'll have to restore probably 1 to 1.5 billion hectares, possibly it will be more. And of course, even if we were to take a median cost of land restoration of $1,500, then we are talking about anything from $1.5 trillion to $2.25 trillion to achieve that target, so which will need tremendous action. But as I started deep, you know, delving deep into this and looking at the economics of land restoration, all the papers were suggesting that, you know, of course, land degradation cost tremendous economic value, you know, as mentioned, $300 billion per year. Investing in land restoration is a fantastic idea. $1 invested will bring returns 7 to $30. But then you get real numbers such as the land degradation is continuing. And as somebody who worked not only in the United Nations, but also in the private sector before that, and I started to wonder, why is that, while all the economics says land investing in land restoration is a good idea, why is that people not investing in that? And clearly, of course, you know, as you all know that all this economic cost is not marketable cost. But even if there's a reasonable amount of marketable cost, it should still be you know, trying to shift the needle, but it is not shifting the needle. The needle is still in the opposite direction. So then I started thinking, is it possible that there is at least some part of this vast amount of degraded land of 2 billion hectares where marketable return from land restoration would be profitable. Therefore, the private sector can invest in it. And if that's the case, then we can look at as to why it's working and why it's not working elsewhere. So this is, and if that's the case, then you can motivate the private sector to play more active role in it. Because you cannot push the private sector to invest their resources, which has an opportunity cost, in things which may have an economic return, but not an impact on their bottom line. So this is the starting point from where we are operating. So in doing research on this, we found that indeed, there are organizations right now where they are investing their resources, borrowed from the market into land restoration and making a return on it. For example, there's a company called Reed Green in Brazil, where they have got money from the market and is restoring 8,000 hectares of land and they have business plan which goes to a million hectares, whereby they're actually right. buying, buying right. the land. So, sorry, Yes, you have one minute. Yes, right. thank, you. Okay. Yeah, thank so you. So okay. the point I'm making is that there is indeed organization who are currently able to tap the market 
raise the resources and make an economic, uh, make a financial return. Um, so what we are trying to do in our, in our organization is to see how close are we to making land restoration profitable on the financial bottom line so that we can motivate more and more private sector companies to invest purely with profit motive to achieve land restoration. And I'll be looking at some of your discussion to see where are those segments where we can give a push, such as carbon credit, such as biodiversity credit, such as water credit, or any other market incentive to make restoration truly profitable. Thank you. Thank you. Papa, you're next. Thank you. Hey, Papa. Am I not pronouncing your name correctly? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. We are not Sorry. hearing anything. Okay. okay. Good. Yes. Mm. Uh, I wanted to stress some points uh, related to economics of land degradation and share a, little, a bit of experience uh, we had. Um, in 2014, we started uh, a project on uh, economics of land degradation in Russia. And since that time, we continue our work on this subject. And we even have uh, at the Faculty of Soil Science uh, a special course uh, for soil scientists and ecologists on the economics of land degradation. I started this course and our colleague Alexei Sarokin is now uh, taking care of this course. Uh, I should state that uh, we had uh, many doubts. The thing that methodology of economics of land degradation still has uh, some gaps that need uh, to be closed, in fact. Uh, the first gap is the assessment, the global assessment of land degradation. Uh, NDVI is not uh, a very secure indicator of the extent of the economics of land degradation, to be honest. Uh, in a, every time we are using uh, remote sensing methods and approaches for assessing land degradation, uh, we have to make some, some survey on the land because it is impossible to show that there is close correlation of the results of NDVI change and uh, real uh, processes of land degradation. For example, if we have a look at the map, we see that in the uh, polar part of Canada and Russia, there are extensive areas that uh, are shown as degraded lands. And it is ascribed to anthropogenic degradation, but it is not true. Uh, I can believe that in uh, the taiga forest, for example, forest fires, they uh, affect their uh, decrease in the NDVI values, but uh, there are other areas where there are no, no any traces of anthropogenic land degradation. That's why this methodology should be improved. The other thing is the assessment of the economics of land degradation, because, well, uh, uh, just Morali told uh, us about the cost of land reclamation, but land reclamation and land degradation have different costs. In some cases, we have uh, some areas where land reclamation is very cheap and easy to do, but in fact, land degradation costs because of the loss of biodiversity, for example, is enormous. And there are other cases when land reclamation is just impossible, like in the case of uh, gully erosion, for example. We just lose the soil and we lose the vegetative cover, and we have no way uh, to re reclaim this land. All this reclamation would cost uh, such a lot that it is not um, economically uh, uh, economically, it is uh, not supported. Uh, the next point we have to discuss as well is uh, the question of uh, the assessment of natural, natural capital for carbon. We're all working on uh, carbon in soils, carbon in biomass, and so on. And it is very easy to speak about land degradation in the terms of carbon, because carbon ca has cost. It is easy to assess. But when we go, for example, to biodiversity, we have much more problems with that. 
because well we cannot explain why uh, two dozens of species of earthworms are most more valuable than, than one dozen of species. Of course, we can make some well sophisticated research on that and study all the well food chains for these uh, soil animals and so on. But uh, we cannot do it for every ecosystem. Sp Pavel, we have no, you have one minute remaining. Yes, we have no time yeah. and we have no resources to do it. That's why there is still some place for research and some place for uh, speculation on the topic of economics of land degradation. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Schauer, very easy to pronounce your name. You're next. Um, thanks for the opportunity for a quick um, intro into um, our ELD initiative um, that was initiated in 2011 and started with a close cooperation with um, ZEF at that time as well. Um, share some experience from our work here. Um, ours, this initiative is meant as a science policy interface. And when we look into um, a robust scientific approach in the studies that have been done under the ELD initiative, this has always been meant in feeding into decision-making processes. There are specific decision-making processes being, be it on the regional level, but also national, subnational level there. So we're using economics as some kind of um, language, if you want, for decision makers to understand the importance of sustainable land management, of investing in restoring um, degradation there or so. And uh, with this referring to the title of the session here, the policy developments there. Um, ELD's work is being ELD, the work of the ELD initiative is focused on robust research, of course, but um, we feed into land management solutions, if you want, on different levels, as I said there, and communicate these results to decision makers, but also to the public. And then I'm picking up what Murali just said there. Um, I think in the beginning, it, in the beginning, when we saw that nice graph that Ephraim had shown there, um, where the research activities on ELD were um, expanding exponentially there, in the beginning, I think it was more about awareness raising. People were not so much aware of the cost of land degradation at that time. And um, the contribution from Zef and others at that time have, um, I think, contributed substantially to the fact that soil is no more dirt under us under our shoes, but it's something valuable there. And we're losing value there when we're destroying it there. And um, this has developed from the need for awareness raising towards a more specific tailored approaches there. This is what the LD initiative currently does with its network. Um, you can see that I'm with GIZ, but um, GIZ, we're not doing all these studies. We are a um, development policy advice coordinating agency. I'm only doing the coordination. The smart work is being done uh, through our network here. We're still working for example, with Alisher and others, unfortunately, I can't show you a picture here in the presentation of Alisher. I had it in there, but it's uh, a network of um, strong institutions, research and policy institutions working together to create um, study processes on different levels, to create capacity development tools, to create communication in the context of land degradation, economics of land degradation, to provide info for better decision making in the end. And um, I had a citation in my presentation from that paper of Alisha and David Wipper there, that there is a need to expand both public and private sector sources um, to fill funding gaps there. I couldn't agree more. This is probably what Morali also referred to. And we need well-designed policies to address the underlying causes of ecosystem restoration, such as market failures and so on. Agreed again, it's the decade on ecosystem restoration. We have all, or some of us have been in this context, working in this context for a while now. 
And I've never seen, even if we're still asking ourselves, and everybody, money in restoration, if it pays off so well, um, I'm seeing an increased interest in Mark, uh, the business minute. case, the yeah. business case of um, economics and economics of ecosystem restoration there. And currently, Morali knows we are putting out um, work in the drought context, there we work in the national context, always on demand. And this is a po good point all that I'd like to make. There is a demand for economics of land degradation out there. And the appetite for this is growing, I think. Based on what has been done before by ZEF, there is a strong demand for economic information, concrete economic information for investments into restoration, into sustainable land management there. Work with UNEP on the state of finance for nature, for example, shows that where these funds could come from and um, leveraging these policies in the context of the three Rio conventions there, Morally is with UNCCD, but I think the connection synergies with the narrative of UNFCCC and um, the Convention to Biodiversity, there's a lot to be gained from that. So. Um, all in all, I think um, we're living in very interesting times right now, and there's a lot of demand for the work that has been done and could be built on. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Alicia, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So with this, I think thank you very much, everybody. We are passing to the second uh, uh, session of our uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, before uh, we start the session, I would like to share some very one-slide ideas just to uh, get the discussion uh, rolling. I will share uh, my slide here. Uh, so this session is called Future Directions Economics in Economics of Ecosystem Restoration. Yes, uh, uh, you uh, read it right. Uh, so before we were discussing about economics of land degradation, now we are talking about economics of ecosystem restoration. This is an intentional shift that's happening now in the field. And this, this shift is in two ways. One is conceptual. So not only land, but we are looking at this from integrated perspective to ecosystems. Yes, definitely soils more in depth, but also relationships of soils and land and trees and these ecosystems as integrated entities. So. So this is one part. Also biodiversity playing an important role in that discussion. Another one shift is operational. So we were talking a lot in the past about degradation. Now we are increasingly talking, increasingly focusing on solutions part, restoration. So discussion is becoming, and research also is becoming a lot more solutions oriented in my uh, per uh, perception. So uh, in that regard, I think uh, uh, if we outline some of the important areas for uh, future economics research on ecosystem restoration, I think uh, we talked a lot today already about the funding needs, several trillion dollars, uh, Murali emphasized. So we need to be realistic. It would be very difficult to get those several trillion dollars in near future. So what does it mean? Research needs to help us with targeting and prioritizing this restoration locations and needs so that we can achieve those restoration objectives in the most effective and efficient way. Secondly, there's increasing understandings. Once we are talking about ecosystems, once we are having, looking at this from systemic perspectives, definitely uh, we see there are synergies and trade-offs between ecosystem restoration across this food production, biodiversity, climate actions, these areas. So the objective of economic research is to help maximize those synergies and help avoid the trade-offs. Financing was mentioned a lot. So what are the best financing opportunities? There's a lot of discussion about carbon, finance, uh, carbon funding, carbon finance, uh, a lot of private public blended finance, uh, green bonds. So what are those most effective, most functioning ways to fund these restoration activities? And also uh, uh, last but not least uh, important aspect uh, that doesn't yet get a lot of attention only from time to time about understanding better cultural values and norms that drive this restoration activities, including also political economy processes. Exactly to do that, we have a very good list of panelists uh, for the second session. 
these are the experts who are pushing frontiers of research in their respective areas of expertise. Uh, I will just list their names here. You can see from Mithile, Professor Mutile Gurumurti from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, uh, doctoral candidate Frederica Schilling from ZEF, Center for Development Research, University of Bonn, uh, Professor Catherine Nakalemba, University of Maryland and NASA Harvest, and Professor David Rupa from Food and Resource Economics Institute at the University of Bonn. So I would suggest we just follow this uh, sequence in the uh, slide. And I would like to, to give the first floor to Professor Mithili Gurumurti. So everybody gets five minutes to statement so that we could also have some discussion with the audience and participants in the audience. You could also already start posting your questions in the question and answer uh, window in the webinar. Thank you very much. Professor Mithili, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Alicia. Yeah, as, uh, actually the interest in uh, economics of land degradation really fueled you know, this uh, due to this joint project. Uh, thanks to Professor Von Braun, okay, for this opportunity. And then you know, this, you know, I try to understand some of these issues in uh, economics of land degradation, what factors grow land degradation. And uh, through that you now I learned many things. And uh, in fact, no, my learnings mostly through the Indian perspective, Indian experience and policies from India. And you know, what I understood from uh, eco, uh, the ecosystem restoration, particularly land restoration. So one thing uh, with which we learned, even policymakers, are the, the community engagement processes. Okay, their involvement, their engagement, how actually you know, it is, we are going to actually realize that. So that is one very important aspect in the uh, context of India and uh, how we are going to actually elicit this, okay, this extract this. So, and then I have a few questions, few issues now I want to raise, okay. One, of course, I actually, you know, um, uh, go with, I align with, you know, Professor Powell, that know that uh, not every land can be restored, okay. Then there are some land degradation which are irreversible, okay. But no, then one interesting question in, on this line is, are we really looking to restore to the original state or we are looking to restore to a status where no, it for, performs some of the functions it would originally you know, was doing? So what really is the task here? It's not as if we are you know, looking to restore each and every land to its original state. I really want to know, you know there are very less you know, like a discussion on this issue. And then, of course, the other one already the expert speakers mentioned the restoration. There are more scientific studies, economic studies needed because, no, I for one believe it's very, very location specific. One solution will not fit for all. So the location specific studies are needed, scientific studies as well as you know, economic studies. And restoration of degraded agricultural land for soil, uh, for crop land. The conservation agriculture practice, it really differs from place to place. And that known that we have very less number of studies. The other interesting question, I think nobody is raising this. So how are we, suppose the land is restored, how are we going to maintain this? Okay, how are we going to maintain that status? Because you now some of these you know, studies you know, which have done some simulation work, some uh, scenario studies, the one particular study, very interesting, they mentioned if 12 million hectare of forest land is restored, the 50% of it is going to be converted to crop protection in course of time. Okay, So how are we going to restore land? How are we going to maintain it? How to incentivize to continue the momentum? So the for what are the effective land management strategies? See, there are two examples from the Indian perspective. No, some of these suggestions have been given by the experts. One is combine with combine these you no know, uh, by restoration efforts with other existing successful programs. For instance, you no, know, like this Nerega, which is an employment guarantee program, where you no know, this uh, rural wage laborers during off season they are provided employment to build some of the rural assets. So that you no, know, they'll have some livelihood opportunities. Also, it will prevent them from moving to cities from rural to urban. So this is one successful program. 
why not reorient refocus it no to actually no in eco land ecosystem restoration so it is like a win one objective the other one uh, generally you know this uh, i found in some of these studies the other uh, area is tourism if restoration is required i mean tourism development requires eco land restoration then can we leverage the tourism benefits in the restoration some of these benefits can be you know like factored into this restoration effects how do we actually you know factor these benefits into this okay this some of these actually you know i found these two very interesting because there are benefits and have those stakeholders have incentive to not only restore but also maintain it in the future okay some of these other things you know some emerging key areas uh, you know like uh, interdisciplinary areas so one has been already mentioned the social and cultural benefit how could this you know be factored into this uh, restoration the other things i found interesting is uh, uh, which which is very 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 which found no very less number of attention the relation between uh, the um, uh, the healthy ecosystem and human health see what are the human health benefits of ecosystem restoration i think this is one uh, one topic really interesting for india because there are uh, there are hardly any studies but no that there are very you no know, like discussion wise there are uh, certain and uh, a very abstract level discussion uh, human health uh, benefits of uh, restoring ecosystem but there are no hot core you no know, systematic economic studies of you no know, what are the benefits out of it how we can factor this into our uh, restoration and the third point is uh, how to uh, build the institutions you no know, for land management okay this has been uh, this is really you no know, very interesting in terms of forest land restoration there is a community you no know, forest rights community rights for forest where this forest act has been amended to you know make involvement of community you no know, more active like how, how to get more actually you no know, uh, more incentive for local people local local communities and it has been recently amended and uh, what are the institutions you no know, like what is the right type of institution for this that is another area and uh, see igidr and our institute have been you no know, doing some work this uh, in the form of research work one is the relation between this uh, health and uh, in fact nutrition and uh, greenery improving greenery okay this you know the other work is this community forest rights how it's going to benefit in terms of restoring you no know, some of this uh, and not only restoring how to keep the interest alive you no know, so that the future this it's not again you no know, damaged these are the two few things now i want to mention and uh, i want uh, some yeah. reactions and uh, also feedbacks for Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mitili, for highlighting this indirect and direct social effects, socioeconomic, human health aspects, but also institutions on land. Thank you. We will have the opportunity to discuss more on that during the question and answer session. Now, uh, let me uh, give the floor to uh, Frederica Schilling. Frederica, please go ahead. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be one of the panelists today to share insights on the economics of ecosystem restoration. And I would like to contribute to today's discussion by introducing the topic of carbon farming as one approach for ecosystem restoration. And I think with this, I also build on what Morales said in the first panel um, towards the end of his speech, uh, where he was referring to private sector engagement, market mechanisms, and also carbon credits. So before I start getting into carbon farming, I just want to make sure that we all have the same understanding of what carbon farming is. So I think carbon farming has emerged in recent years more as a buzzword. But basically what we are meaning when we are talking about carbon farming are two aspects. So on the one hand, we talk about sustainable ag agricultural practices that increase carbon storage, both in vegetation and soils. So in terms of the practices, we are looking, for example, at agroforestry, cover crops, uh, minimum tillage, or improved organic fertilizer management, such as manure and compost. But with carbon farming, we also um, look at a second aspect, and this is the underlying business model whereby the carbon that has been stored, like after the adoption of sustainable land management practices, is traded at carbon markets and is hence generating income opportunities. So why is carbon farming relevant in the context of ecosystem restoration? 
So I think we are all here aware of the importance of soil organic carbon or organic matter as a key indicator for soil health. Um, so carbon farming supports the restoration of degraded soils by creating incentives for the adoption of improved agricultural practices. And therefore, the importance of carbon farming stems from this, energy, this, um, this synergy between ecological objectives, so ecosystem restoration, and economic objectives in terms of generating um, opportunities. So at CEF, we are conducting a research project under the PARI program. That's the program of accompanying research for agricultural innovation. And there we look specifically at the challenges and opportunities of integrating smallholder farmers into carbon markets. And we focus here on specifically the voluntary carbon market, and most of our insights are from East Africa, um, mostly from Kenya. And this is also what I would like to share here. And research on carbon farming requires interdisciplinary research teams, because if you look at carbon farming, it touches upon different aspects. Agriculture in terms of the practices, soil science, um, soil scientists are needed for soil carbon sequestration, we need the forestry sector, and also economists, um, just among others. So given the short time we have today, I would like to emphasize two areas where um, we see future potential for more research, more interdisciplinary research. So the first area I would like to emphasize is the challenge of measuring carbon stock. And here I'm sp referring today specifically to soil carbon. Um, because to make carbon a tradable good, accurate monitoring of carbon stocks is key. Because if you want to sell something, especially something that's invisible, or kind of invisible, in the case of soil carbon, you need to make sure it exists. So to date, most of the um, measurement approaches are based on laboratory methods. And those are costly, time-consuming, and also labor-intensive. And therefore, in practice, they are oftentimes not implemented on the ground if you look at carbon farming practices or carbon farming projects here in East Africa, where we are doing our research projects. So we see that the carbon farming projects on the ground rather rely on modeling using Roth C models instead of soil sampling. But this also generated some concerns in terms of the um, reliability of the results and um, whether we can trust those carbon credits. So what is needed is more research on cost-effective measurement of soil carbon stocks um, that is applicable to carbon farming projects so that those approaches can be used in the projects to generate carbon credits. And those could be like innovative solutions, looking, for example, at new portable soil scanners, looking at the combination of soil sampling with remote sensing, um, satellite-based modeling, et cetera, so um, that we look at what are the cost accuracy trade-offs, like what, how accurate do the measurements need to be? And how can they be used by those carbon farming projects? So that's the first area that I want to highlight. So the challenges regarding to innovations in carbon measurement that's applicable to carbon farming projects. And then the second aspects I would like to highlight are the transaction costs re related to those carbon farming projects. Because in theory, it all sounds like an interesting concept, but it also comes at some cost. And those costs are, for example, related to the development of project baselines, developing the project documents, certification of the project. Um, those are all fixed costs, but also then towards the implementation and administration of those projects. And these high fixed costs are a significant barrier to the development of cost-effective products that can allow smallholder farmers to participate. So what is needed are also innovative solutions that reduce transaction costs. So for example, areas that go into um, building on farmer groups, building on clusters, building on existing projects and initiatives and networks on the ground, peer monitoring, et cetera. So this is the second area that I would like to emphasize. So the challenges of transaction costs and how these can be reduced in order to allow smallholder farmers to benefit uh, from those markets. Great, thank you very much, Frederica. These are great suggestions. The theory of transaction costs is almost 100 years, but its application to land restoration is only now burgeoning and becoming a very hot topic indeed. And also thank you for highlighting the MRV, so monitoring, reporting, verification, which is the vulnerability spot in carbon farming, not only in soil carbon sequestration, but also in other areas, like even in livestock uh, based or even in rice paddies, methane reduction. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll have more chances to discuss more on this, but now let us go, give the floor to our next speaker, uh, uh, Professor Catherine Nakalemba. Catherine, please go ahead. 
Um, thank you. And thank you for um, having me this morning. It's a pleasure. And I'm already learning so much and uh, I appreciate um, everybody's remarks uh, previously. My remarks will probably build a little bit of, on Paval's as well as uh, what Federica just talked about, the first, um, you know, measuring and, and monitoring, which I think is something that's particularly interesting from the perspective of um, the work that I do. Um, in terms as it, my comments sort of will relate to um, the study that was, you know, the book that was published, and this was published, I think, 2016. And since 2016, you know, there's been, you can see an explosion. Um, and I right now feel like I sound like a kind of a, bro a broken record in, in terms of, um, you know, talking about the rapid advances that we've had, not only in um, satellite uh, data accessibility, um, in addition to uh, methods, as well as computational capabilities that, have, that now allow us to do a lot more with what's available. That could be really critical and useful for uh, monitoring and evaluation and trying to quantify things that we're unable to quantify before. In addition to um, the resolution of those data sets that have become available. So the Sentinel satellites were launched in 2016. Um, we have Sentinel-1 uh, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, uh, we have a couple of others that are specifically focused on um, looking at uh, soil moisture, soil, um, some, some, some that could be used, for example, for looking at uh, soil health as sort of uh, as it relates to vegetation condition. We have uh, much higher resolution um, ways of looking at NDVI from the from the book what I noticed is a lot of the the work was done looking at using modus and there are you know huge advantages to having used modus but since then there's been quite an explosion in what we're able to do um the other part uh that is sort of related to advances in technologies you know uh, if you, you know think about we're in the age of machine learning among other things is being able to combine different data sets uh that tell us different things about what's going on in the over a very complex system. So looking at soil soil data that is collected in the field that's collected maybe in spruce context and trying to model that over really large areas, for example. Uh, there are huge efforts that have gone towards collecting data for different purposes. That could be really critical for uh, understanding what's really happening. That could be really critical in terms of um, guiding and informing restoration, assessing interventions. Uh, there's a, a, a you know, discussions around how can we use uh, remote sensing data to be able to monitor and evaluate really large landscapes using that synoptic op uh, opportunity that the data offer. But then how can we combine it with other data sets that typically we're not able to uh, combine it with? In order to do this, obviously, um, you know, the remote sensing, machine learning, computer science uh, uh, perspective is very, you know, quantitative based looking at land use change or land cover change over a certain area and how that might relate to you know other other indicators but this in order to really understand the broader questions that we're trying to answer here we need to be able to collaborate with other individuals which is a point that Federica mentioned also so ecologists agronomists economists social scientists land managers among others I make fun of myself that I can monitor um crop land and uh, and um, tell you you know if it's change if it's healthy but I can't really tell you about how well how well a particular uh, plant functions so this requires somebody who has those expertise in order for us to be asking the right question as well as identifying flaws and you know what's wrong with what we're doing the other is the opportunity to collaborate with other stakeholders who have access to uh, it could be farmers who are operating in very remote areas it could be people who are trying to provide better services for example for, for soil restoration? How do you leverage that access to better inform the models that we're building to predict um, you know, what's happening with the land, as well as if the responses and interventions that are being put on the ground are working? And so to kind of wrap up, um, just to, it's also, it's, this is also a response to a question that I saw in the chat, is like, what things could be done, uh, you know, that could bring the study that's been done to, you know, to uh, we can use you can use the word the cutting edge or the, the frontiers of where we are. So incorporating multiple data sets right now with the computation capabilities we have, you can use all data sets over the same landscape. Uh, do it at much higher resolution and understand what's happening. We can use uh, radar, lidar, 
um, combine optical senses, modus, land, sad, sentinel, and be able to fill in gaps and look at places we were unable to look at before at a scale that is much, much more granular. There are sub-daily senses from which we could potentially understand uh, and look at you know the same place over many years, but look at it um, every day. And we could try and, and you know, correlate that with what's actually happening on the ground. So leveraging machine learning, you know, can be overstated, being able to combine those additional data sets. There are things related to computer vision, trying to look at tiles that have changed really rapidly or have consistently degraded is some work that could be done. Uh, integrating multiple evidence of uh, degradation. Think about fertilizer as a source of land degradation. How do you how do you figure that out? Could it be something related to access to fertilizer and maybe unregulated uh, use of it? Trying to model and really communicate that is really important for decision making. There are other data sets, uh, sorry, other indices that have become possible with the newer data sets that we have, looking at biomass, um, or combining things like EVI that allow us to really understand degradation beyond um, just NDVI. Um, obviously, uh, Federica mentioned this also, a strong, robust data collection on the ground is really important with satellite remote sensing. We cannot replace uh, on the ground sensors. So trying to collect additional data sets that then we can combine and build better models with the satellite data is really critical. And obviously my last, um, my last comment is around exploring impact on ecosystem services and human well-being. So trying to combine crop conditions, vegetation conditions, um, and how that relates to food security outcomes for a particular region and how that might relate to um, better productivity. Or if uh, people have alternative sources of income that might not be related particularly straight directly to agriculture, but could be from uh, carbon farming, as an example. Can we can we quantify and show that well-being is, uh, you know, is being achieved without the primary uh, land use of agriculture as the source of um, as a source of income and food security for uh, communities that don't have access to um, other alternatives? Um, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you a lot for highlighting the rapidly expanding capabilities of remote sensing and also in combination with uh, artificial intelligence and other new methods of analysis. And I hope uh, in the near future we'll be able to answer those challenges that uh, Professor Ratan Lal posed to us at the beginning and also that challenge that Frederica mentioned about measuring soil carbon. Also, thank you for highlighting the role of the interdisciplinary research working together, including on uh, uh, addressing these ecosystem-related issues and how ecosystems and societies and people can uh, be uh, living together in a sustainable and, uh, way. Thank you very much. Now, uh, before we go to the discussion part, let us give the uh, final- Alishir, may I interrupt for a moment, please? Just very, very short. Yes, and yes, yes. I apologize, yes. I have to leave, but I wanted to commend uh, carbon farming presentation. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, do not get bogged down on measurement, monitoring, and verification. If you can adopt, I mean, as a soil scientist, we like to have more business of soil testing, no question about that. But I don't want that to become a bottleneck in making carbon farming practical. And we have a very good example of CRP, where the photographs of land used were used as a surrogate for runoff and erosion control and farmers were paid for retiring the land. My other point, a very quick one, is uh, why I said soil degradation may have a different cost. It's really a question of methodology, not of terminology. If we were to monitor impact of soil erosion, salinity, nutrient depletion, carbon depletion, loss of live biomass, water logging, vegetation degradation, slope deformation, and pool those costs together, that would be soil degradation. So it's really a methodology, but a lot more work. I, I This is an excellent, uh, and I got to go. Please forgive me for that. But uh, I hope I'll be able to join full time next time. Thank you. Ratan, before you leave, apologies to you, Alicia. This is a moment to thank you, to thank you for being the rigorous and pain in the neck reviewer of the book. Uh, which we published in uh, 2016. Wow. Without your um, support and your constructive critique 
uh, we wouldn't have achieved it. So thank you that you uh, received the World Food Prize as a soil scientist is one other indication of the trends which um, Ephraim had shown earlier at his opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's go to David Wupper. David, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting webinar. I'm really enjoying this listening to everybody. So I will also try to keep it short so we have some time for discussion. Um, yeah, I, I really like um, the, the global focus that we talked a lot about here. I think it's important to sometimes also have the big picture. I'm a big fan of small case study, but I think sometimes it's also nice to bring everything together and have, a, have, have the big picture view on things. Of course, that brings a lot of challenges, and I'm really currently focusing on trying to address a lot of these challenges, but they're there are many and they're important. So the, the one important challenge that I'm seeing is really establishing causality. I think in economics, we have these tools that help us to establish causality or go near causality, but they are really important, I think. And very often we can make big mistakes if we are ignoring the issue of causality. For example, if we look at vegetation indices like NDVI to measure land degradation. Maybe land degradation means that NDVI goes up or that it goes down. In, in um, high intensity agricultural places like Switzerland, farmers are being paid to extensify. So the government pays good money that the farmers use less fertilizer and pesticides and other inputs on the grasslands. So if we measure that after policies were implemented, NDVI goes down, that's a measure of success of successful policy. And we might be able to connect that to an increase in biodiversity. So we might see that because the NDVI goes down, because the inputs are reduced, we see an increase in biodiversity. We might find some rare indicator plants that really need extensively used grassland. And that also shows that it's really important to sometimes not mix too many things together, simply because we should not use the same indicator on lands, where on some land the indicator should go up if it's land improvement, and on other land it should go down and then it's land improvement. So that is directly connected to the issue of causality. But the main use for, for our group where we focus on causality is where we try to specifically focus on policies. So we are mostly motivated to identify under which conditions, which policies work. So in different contexts, very different mixes of policies might be needed. And we try to out when different mixes work best, um, which means we really have to pay close attention to heterogeneity and conditions. And I believe that we really need rigorous evidence on what works, because I think very often people are quite unclear about policy effects. I think you, you make life difficult for some farmers because you regulate things, and the farmers don't really know whether those policies have any good effect or not. And the same for, for citizens, taxpayers, the policymakers themselves. So I think it's really important that we do a good job to rigorously provide evidence which policies work, plus I think really make suggestions how to improve policies, because I think basically nobody really knows what policies are needed. I think very often we, I, I heard lately from somebody who said, we know the, the ingredients, but we don't know the recipe. So very often we know a little bit about mixing regulations and payments, but, but then when we get to the details, we don't really need to know, and we need a lot of trial and error, but we can't afford to just play around. We cannot just try forever and, and not have any clue. So I think we need the rigorous evidence. 
And then finally, and that will be my final remark, um, I think it's also important that we really get back to definitions. Because I think sometimes people talk about restoration and they have in mind restoring a certain land to its natural condition. Whereas I think many economists understand under restoration the highest economic value of that land. So it could well be that a certain place uh, is not in its natural condition, but it has achieved its highest economic value, or a place is in its natural value, but there would be a higher economic value. Um, and that has a lot of implications. Among others, there might be places that are quite degraded from a natural scientific standpoint, but maybe this state of degradation provides quite a lot of economic value to local communities. So there might be people who need a forest to have forest wood, uh, for forest, firewood for heating, and the heating, the, the, the resource of the forest is really important for them. So the economic value is very important. And restoring that to a natural condition would be actual, maybe for them would be degradation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, David, for highlighting the importance of rigorous causal analysis uh, and also importance of uh, uh, finding out those uh, policies uh, that work in this very, very heterogeneous context. So uh, thank you very much. Now I would like to uh, pass the uh, floor to Professor uh, von Braun. Uh, shall we go uh, with the uh, audience questions? Uh, how uh, would you propose we proceed? Alicia, I suggest uh, you do a round of um, a Q and A if there is uh, appetite for it uh, among the panelists um, and people online, and then give me maybe six seven minutes at the end to wrap it up. Please um, continue from your end. Okay, thank you very much. So I saw two questions in the chat actually, which both of them are related to agroecology. So uh, what is the role of agroecology, agroecological practices in land restoration? Anyone would like to uh, tackle this question, address, start addressing this question, responding to it among the panelists? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pavel, please go ahead. Okay, uh, first I have to say that agroecology has several meanings. Um, in, in natural sciences and in the agricultural sciences, agroecology uh, is believed to be a scientific discipline that aims to reduce the impact of agriculture on the environment. Well, but also it has another me a meaning and uh, it is a movement. Uh, that became popular in many countries, in, in, especially in Latin America. And I had experience, I worked, uh, I attended an, a, an excursion organized by uh, agroecologists, uh, in, in, to say they were university professors, but they uh, promoted agroecology among uh, the farmers in Brazil. I have to say that agroecology has uh, a good and uh, healthy basis. Uh, it means that uh, agroecology tries to reduce the impact of ch agricultural chemicals, for example, on soil, prevent soil erosion, and to mm, well to, to bring some elements of. Uh, cooperation among the farmers. But also I have to say that as a political, well, very politized movement, it also has some negative uh, sides. For example, uh, the lack of fertilizers results in, uh, for example, elements, nutrient mining in soils. You cannot exploit soils without, without bringing back the elements uh, then uh, uh, no, uh, so, uh, without putting some fertilizers. It's just impossible. 
just uh, we cannot uh, expand this experience to all the uh, agricultural uh, sector in this sense. But of course, it is a good experience for some uh, limited groups of enthusiastic uh, farmers. That is my vision. And uh, uh, to be honest, I'm against using this experience, uh, scaling up it to all the uh, issues related to uh, land degradation. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone would like to uh, add uh, to these uh, points? Uh, uh, mentioned by Pavel on the question. Uh, of course, uh, we also uh, uh, know that uh, uh, it was mentioned by several panelists about the heterogeneity of conditions con in every different locations. So there are many locations where agroecology, especially when it's uh, done uh, following the uh, uh, well-established rules, it will uh, uh, help with land restoration, ecosystem restoration, but also it's important how, how uh, not only what to do, but how to do that. We also have cases when sudden, sudden uh, uh, implementation of agroecology also led to uh, disruptions in the food systems uh, uh, in some countries in Southeast uh, South Asia. So we need to take into account all these lessons and try to see agroecology, take the best of it, and then try to apply where it fits best uh, in terms of improving ecosystems, in terms of raising livelihoods, in terms of other also, but also social goals, because one of social agroecology among the important elements of agroecology is increasing inclusiveness uh, and uh, reducing marginality as well. Yefraim? Yeah, okay. uh, my question goes to Morali. Uh, you mentioned something very interesting about uh, the, the 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 progress that we have made in achieving the land degradation neutrality, and uh, um, and again I go back to Catherine, who gave us really good uh, promising uh, approaches of being able to monitor the land, the, how it changes, and all that, and the in, uh, the increasing knowledge about uh, AI, and a lot of other things. Now, I think, is there a way that, uh, well, that maybe the UN or any other agency can establish a system of really monitoring the progress that we have made and the, 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 the kind of problems that we have in the, in the, the land degradation and all that? I think that will inform us a lot uh, and be able to say, okay, are we achieving anything? Are we not achieving anything? Because there are some countries, uh, I think I've seen in Bokara Musa in the, is in the, is in the, in the group here that uh, Niger has been one of the countries that have been uh, achieving uh, the restoration of land degradation and all that, so that other people can be able to learn and be able to be motivated that, okay, there are countries which are achieving restoration of uh, degraded land. So is there a sort of a, a plan for having a regular update of uh, progress towards achieving uh, these goals? Thank you. Thank you. A very yeah. important question. Now, land restoration commitments are made by countries as well as by other actors in multiple forms and formats. For example, in 2011, already there was the bond challenge where the country is committed to achieving 150 million hectares by 2020. And now it stands at 350 million hectares by 2030. Under the LDN, country is committed to 450 million hectares to be restored. Under the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, the previous one, countries had committed. Under the INDCs, countries had committed. Under the AFR 100, countries have committed. So there are multiple commitments to restoration and each of these commitments have a follow-up mechanism, such as when it's LDN, so the UNCCD periodically asks the countries and they make reports. Similarly, uh, Convention to Combat Biological Diversity and on behalf of the bond challenge, IUCN collect the commitments and they're reported on what is called the bond barometer. <laughs> So there is a range of ways in which the information is collected 
coming back. However, there is no single overarching geo-coordinated um, statement of where achievements are being made. And this is something which everyone is cognizant about. So when the decade for ecosystem restoration was established in 2020, this was seen as a drawback. And together, a number of actors, actually I counted 42 separate databases on land restoration monitoring. So a number of them came together and under the leadership of the FAO, there is now a database called FAM. I think it's called FAM Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring. So this is currently being um, populated. The framework is there. But at the same time, for the point which you are mentioning, that's slightly different. This is to share best practices. And now there are at least two situations where this is being shared. Number one is WOCAT, the World of <coughs> Overview of um, Conservation Technologies, has close to 3,000 case studies of land restoration best practices. So you can get those. And any, anyone who has best practice can also submit. Then, we also have restore, R-E-S-T-O-R -E without an E, which is maintained by the ETH in Zurich, which has thousands of individuals putting up their case studies there. We have, at, at the G20 Global Land Initiative, we have now prepared a, a website which compiles all these various databases and platforms so that somebody who wants to know about this in the case of best practices or restoration databases, there's one single window where they can go. So there are ways in which you can find this information. At the same time, there is no single overarching window yet where all the restoration achievements, be it individual, be it private sector, be it NGOs, is presented in a verified manner this is not at there, and firm is probably a direction where we might achieve this. I will put the website in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We have some questions in the uh, 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 in the chat, uh, 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 and uh, a couple of them relate to remote sensing uh, and addressed directly to Catherine. Uh, they concern the difficulty of getting the training uh, data sets. Uh, 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 for example, for rice fields, Catherine would like. Would you like to uh, comment on these uh, on these feedbacks? Yeah, um, sure. So um, I think all of these are, are very valid and they're very very critical questions, particularly around um, ground data. So as I mentioned before, we've had an explosion in terms of data sets um, that you know we can do all sorts of really incredible things with. And as I also mentioned before, we can't remove the importance of ground data in terms of, you know, you can't uh, you can't train a model to predict where rice is, for example, without feeding the model examples of rice. Uh, and rice in different contexts is also different. So while it might be possible to uh, do it extensively uh, in areas where you have extensive rice growing, uh, let's say in Bangladesh. Um, where by just visual interpretation, you can see for sure there's a rice field and create a, um, your label data or training data by interpreting images. It might not be possible to do it in Tanzania, for example. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, this is something that I work on extensively trying to figure out a way of collecting data so we can map places that are previously unmapped because we have the satellite data, but we don't have the training data. Um, and, you know, the gaps are really huge. It's a little bit complicated because I think sometimes there are efforts uh, that are piecemeal one time, you know, we collect data extensively in one country in one year and move on, um, or we collect data extensively in one country for one crop, um, or we collect data extensively, we could collect, collect extensive soil samples for one year and move on. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, inconsistencies and different use cases. So everybody collects what they collect for the particular purpose that they want to collect it for. 
Um, and you know, primarily where I focus my research, uh, looking um, in Africa, we have enormous gaps that uh, you know in space and in time. So we have um, you know you can get extensive maze data maybe in Kenya in 2020, and there might not be any other data set that is similarly related to that same data set to, for you to be able to develop a, a decent maze map, or you would not be able to do like yield for example, or yield data were not collected. And so this is a you know a fundamental problem, and I feel like I, I'm constantly preaching about it because. If we're to harness that value um, of being able to measure consistently, we have to invest in the data. They're not only used for training and predicting, they're also used for evaluating. Uh, Because on the flip side of remote sensing is we see a lot of products that are being put out there that are not validated. Um, You know, where we, you know, when you find something on the internet, I think there's the assumption that it is correct and is the best. And depending on how well the promotion and the, you know, publicizing of a product is, everybody goes with it as it is. If it comes from a very strong research group, you you absolutely believe it as the gold standard. Uh, But when you start to look at geographies, you know, if you start to look at a a global cropland map, and then zoom into, let's say, the Ethiopian highlands, you will find big giant holes in that, in that product. So the on the flip side of it is while we're getting an explosion of input data and output uh, data sets, they're not very well validated across really large landscapes. So, um, you know, going to if I'm a, a question also from before is in order there, for there to be a concerted, coordinated way of doing monitoring and evaluation using uh, these data sets, we have to address, you know, the the gaps consistently, and there has to be multi-year um, efforts to collect consistent, broad data sets that would allow those interdisciplinary studies that we're talking about with a very systematic um, collection. This is sort of like a a dream uh, a dream idea in 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 that sense, being able to look at the same areas consistently over time collect you know everything from under the under under you know everything from soil um to what's on top of the soil to what's put on the soil and look at it over time and validate the products that then we look at later on um, is critical and that being able to combine those over time will be a critical input so some of the biggest advances or the the most in, intuitive or really useful things that have come out is being able to look at NDVI time series over any area is really powerful, um, but that is just you know one very basic uh, data that you get. If you can look at these different indicators that are modeled in a um, contextually relevant uh, combinations of uh, approaches over time, uh, we can then really, really quantify and understand what might be going on and how it relates to decisions that need to be made. Thank Great. You. Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. I see there are many, many more questions are coming as we speak. So that uh, testifies to the raising interest of the audience and also the curiosity uh, that uh, our discussions are generating. But I also see that we are coming to an end uh, slowly of our uh, webinar. So uh, uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, uh, von Braun uh, to uh, 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 draw conclusions uh, from uh, what the, from the discussions. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, all speakers, all listeners, especially uh, thank you to, uh, to Ephraim and Alicia that you brought us together. Uh, um, this, uh, this discussion needs to go on. This research needs to go on. I want to um, make a few remarks on research agenda and a few remarks on policy implications. Um, First, uh, <clears throat> if we look back um, the eight years since uh, uh, the um, economics of land degradation uh, uh, volume and the related research emerged, um, a big change um, in uh, how we look at food systems external effects has happened. And that surfaced in the context of the debates about the agenda of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. The debate has moved to um, uh, the approach of true cost of food, true costing, all the externalities, 
the environmental, the social, and the health externalities of how the food system works. The ELD work laid the groundwork for the environmental externalities, and then came health and, uh, and social uh, externalities. And this is now a big agenda worldwide um, in which, uh, um, so I highlight that because it is an impact um, of uh, early conceptualization of external effects of the food system. My second um, research remark uh, relates to the um, uh, looking uh, inside the soil beyond nutrients, beyond soil nutrients, as a frontier of, uh, of soil science, of soil health-related science. So um, um, the valuation of um, uh, soil life uh, was by some of you already highlighted as an area uh, which we um, uh, need to focus on in the future. Uh, so uh, uh, the biodiversity and the, the value of species, not just the diversity of, but the value of species for biopharmaceuticals, many of which relate to soil life, um, and the biotechnologies um, the new bioscience offer great opportunities, but for us economists um, lead to great challenges of proper valuation. So soil nutrients for the soil scientists remain essential, but soil life poses um, big challenges for um, interdisciplinary uh, research. My um, third um, uh, a comment on, on research uh, relates to um, what can we learn from local and indigenous knowledge as scientists and how can we bring together science and indigenous and local knowledge um, in the field of um, uh, land management and, 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 and understanding soils. And um, the last point on research agenda, <clears throat> um, we have this challenge on the measurement, the measurement of uh, carbon stocks um, uh, and their change. Um, maybe we need to be um, uh, watching uh, more carefully in the future uh, what is happening in high tech, in high science, in particular in quantum physics. In quantum physics, um, the quantum sensory developments are moving very fast in the health area. So uh, um, sniffing molecular changes um, um, to identify uh, people health, um, maybe these are uh, high-tech science developments uh, which also can help us identify changes in soil health, in soil life. So um, I, um, uh, I think soil science and the economics of soils um, needs to open up to, to high tech and high science um, in, in the fields of um, um, not only bioscience, but also in the field of quantum physics. That's, that's a message which I would like to leave you with. Uh, lastly, a couple of points on policy. I think we can be very grateful and uh, applaud that G20 um, and the United Nations with the UN United Nations Food Systems Summit have uh, put um, soils and soil health high on the agenda. Um, that is increasingly driven by climate um, and climate crisis. Um, we need to embrace the finance agenda in that context that was mentioned by several of you. But fundamentally, I feel that um, the economics of soils need to be integrated under the umbrella of the bioeconomy, a bio-based economy, um, in which um, ecosystems restorations um, 
and transactions costs are critical uh, economic um, uh, considerations. But we need to keep the eye on the ball, that is soil, soil health. Uh, um, and in the context of the bioeconomy, the issue of land rights, and uh, sustain, which are so critical for sustainable use of land and soils, uh, need to be higher on the moved higher on the um, on the policy agenda. With these remarks, I think we have a big research agenda. Um, we have a big policy agenda. Um, I think we need to bring the two together, as you, Mark, have highlighted. Uh, you, Mark Schauer, um, all of you have actually connected soils to people and people to soils and their health and their behavior and um, their opportunities um, and the risks of soil and land degradation. So um, with these uh, words, thank you all again. And I look to you, uh, Alicia and Ephraim, to consider bringing us together at some point and maybe building on this healthy debate which we had today, um, a maybe a policy brief to revisit the economics of land and soil degradation and ecosystems restoration agenda. Thank you very much.